excited to be able to introduce today's speaker, John Emberger. John is the Director of Respiratory Care at Christiana Care. He is also a fellow of the AARC, a Lean Six Sigma Black Belt, as well as a certified professional in healthcare quality. John has many different uh, research publications, as well as abstracts that he has provided since early on in his respiratory care career. Additionally, he has lectured nationally for more than 20 years on critical care topics. John is an active member with the Delaware Society of Respiratory Care, as well as very active nationally with the AARC. Well, welcome John, and let's go ahead. I'm going to make sure that I provide you the opportunity to share your screens, if you just. Okay, great. Can you hear me you fine? We can say it now. Okay. And you got the uh, presentation up. All right, great. Um, so if I'm going to turn my camera off because otherwise I'm going to be watching that and not doing the lecture. So, so I'm here to talk about PI and implementation of new strategies in the respiratory world. Um, I'll have my I have my email on this slide. I have my email at the end as well. If anyone ever wants to uh, email me, reach out about this or really any other topic. Um, so let's see, what do I have to do to move my slides? There we go. Um, so I have to give conflicts of interest. I've received honorarium from a couple places for, for doing lectures just like this. Um, none of that conflicts with the content that you'll see today. Quick outline of where we're gonna go. Where we're gonna go is we're gonna talk about the pressures on respiratory departments nowadays because part of this has to do with, you know, why is PI tough? why is implementing things tough in the respiratory world nowadays? Um, there's a lot of pressure on respiratory departments. So we're gonna kind of dive into what the, what drives those, that pressure. We're gonna talk about, um, I just wanna define what I mean by implementation, what I mean by PI, and then really um, give sort of a very quick overview of PI methodologies, some PI tools, some change management practices, dashboards, data, so really uh, performance improvement, quality improvement, really just try and um, dive just a little bit into these things. Now, uh, I will, as a side note, say uh, uh, this stuff, if, you, if it's unfamiliar to you, you're not gonna know it really well just from my talk here because th this stuff takes a long time to kind of learn and bathe yourself in a little bit before you really have a good handle on it. I'm gonna try and hit the high points of these things. And then I'm going to try and walk through two different examples of implementing and PI that, that you might have, and you'll be able to substitute your things in for your department, I think, by how I kind of walk through these examples and talk about different pieces. And then we'll do a summary and give you some take-home points. So what about the pressures of respiratory departments nowadays? I mean, the top thing on here has to be staffing. I have it staffing, staffing squared, right? So staffing the shortage. We have a low amount of graduates. We have a uh, nursing shortage, which I will just say nursing shortage causes pressure on the respiratory department because you have nurses that are either you may have agency nurses in your facility at times and you may just have nursing that is short. Either thing will cause pressure on the respiratory department to do those things that are shared between uh, respiratory and nursing, maybe uh, more so than uh, than if we didn't have a nursing shortage. So. Staffing, from a staffing standpoint, I just like to remind people of this. Everyone in the respiratory world needs to hear this. So this here, this graph, is the graduates from our uh, respiratory programs in this country. So this graph, and what you see is the most recent is we have about 6,000 graduates per year. And yes, it has gone down and COVID has affected us, but we have about 6,000 new graduates per year, which sounds maybe good at first. This depiction here in this uh, picture is the over 6,200 hospitals in the country, according to the AHA. So if we round things a little bit, you could say there's about one graduate per hospital per year. I'm not sure about your hospital, but I need more than one graduate per year typically. So um, this, this is one of the things that drives, it's fueling our, our shortage. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is the NBRC projects that nearly a thousand therapists a year will begin to retire over the next 10 years. So 
10 years worth of 1,000 people leaving the field. Um, so you've got 10,000, roughly close to 10,000 people over the next 10 years leaving the field, in addition to the fact that we just don't have enough graduates to start with. So there are these huge pressures on, on us from a staffing standpoint in respiratory. Financial pressures. What, what's financial pressure mean? Well, this is just uh, just an article I pulled. It was a, about one week ago from the Wall Street Journal. It talks about hospital distress worsens amid our labor scarcity and inflation. So what's happened is growing number of facilities, hospitals are in financial distress or getting close to or declaring bankruptcy because of the pressure of labor shortages, the high inflation they're dealing with because you know everything you're feeling at home the, the hospitals are feeling from the standpoint of our costs go up because things cost more right now in this high inflation environment we're in, in this wake of the pandemic. And, and you add to that labor shortage where you need to beef up uh, pay to people. So financially, it's really bad for hospitals right now. I believe I've heard that the vast majority of facilities in this country are probably finishing the uh, have just finished three or four of the worst financial years that they've ever had in many cases. So there's financial pressures. There's value pressures on us. Like, so there's this idea of um, that you've probably heard where Gary Kaufman talking about, or you hear, um, you've seen the articles from Gary Kaufman and, um, and uh, Chatburn about changing respiratory to be value-based, looking at what, what, what things are valued and only doing those things. We also have pressures like expectations and satisfaction of the workforce. You have to keep people satisfied or they'll leave and your staffing problem gets even worse. You know, when we talk about expectations of the workforce, um, this is just an example of, uh, of met one of many brand new articles, six things Gen Z workers want from their healthcare employers. So this falls under the, can we actually keep people happy? They want, they want career growth and development. Um, they want technology-driven driven facilities. Most are. They want focus to be focused on diversity and inclusion. They want work-life balance, mental health support, a socially responsible organization, right? So this is a Forbes article that's brand new. What do newer generations of employees want, and can your business adjust? You know, can healthcare places keep new generations of the workforce satisfied to stay? Um, staff competence and Better care. We always want to get better, and that's part of the PI that we're going to talk about. But I have on here agency, and this is not to say if you're an agency therapist, I'm not saying agency therapists are not or cannot be smart or skilled or anything like that. But the fact of the matter is, if you have travelers or agency pay, uh, uh, workforce in your hospital, which when I talk to people around the country, many, many people are using them. That is just, it's a group of people who are not necessarily, they were not hired to, to act upon the values and the vision of your hospital. Quite frankly, they're there because there's a potential for a large paycheck. Again, it, it's a need nowadays. Again, I, I'm not saying anything necessarily bad about it, but you have to keep in, you know, the, the more agency people you have in your department, the more travelers, the more difficult, the more pressure there is for maintaining competence and then also improving care. Um, and also as respiratory departments, we have to stay relevant, right? We wanna be cutting edge. When new grads come in, if you're not cutting edge, you're not relevant, you're not evidence-based, um, you're not doing the best care possible, then um, they're less likely to come in and uh, wanna work for you. They're gonna go down the street to another place that is relevant or cutting edge. So lots of pressures on respiratory departments. So let me talk quickly about um, just this implementation in the title, implementation and versus PI. I try to separate the, the concepts here, but as you'll see um, towards the end, I'll actually blend them nicely together because I think they go hand in hand. But implementation, we're really talking about implementing things, getting to the point of using a new device, a new strategy, implementing something new, starting to use it. It likely involves education, can involve competency checks, could involve policy changes, uh, probably likely involves communication with your depart within your department and probably outside your department when you implement things. Performance improvement. So we're looking at things, and I have over here, I have VI, PI, QI. These are really making reference to, you could, you could almost interchange these terms, a value improvement, 
performance improvement, quality improvement, quality insurance, any of these types of terms, these are all things where you are doing a continuous cycling strategy to increase either value or efficiency of the of the department your um or increase the desired effects of an organization so get better and you're continuously striving to get better so it's cyclic and it's a continuous striving to get better so that's performance improvement as i mentioned when we talk about these uh couple different case uh sort of studies i guess for things you'll see how they kind of fit together in a sense. But before that, I wanna give you just a quick tour of PI methodologies, PI tools. And what I hope is that you're not in this situation. Um, I've always loved this, this cartoon here, these Lego people. So um, you've got the guy here trying to offer these people, um, you know, real wheels. And they're like, sorry, you know, too busy to think about implementing something new like that. No, thanks, we're busy. And you really wanna, we are busy and, um, and it's not gonna get any better. You wanna have a mindset where things can be improved on even though we are busy. I wanna, I wanna sort of sidestep and make reference to, I guess I'll say the potential in healthcare. So when you look at the airline industry, um, they have been um, very entrenched, the airline and the car industry, very entrenched in performance improvement for some time now. And it's really good they are because um, for the airline industry, let's, I, I like to say, suppose that there's a 99% success rate in the airline industry, all right? So if we suppose that, what that means is you sit down on your Southwest plane and the friendly pilot who's making you know funny remarks comes over and says, we are 99% uh, sure that we are going to land safely today and not crash and have um, all loss of life on this thing, on this plane. That would translate, 99% success rate would translate to what we call in terms of uh, performance improvement, 10,000 defects per million mathematically, because we think of terms and things in, in terms of millions of defects. So 10,000 out of a million are defective. That's, that's the equivalent of 1% is 1% uh, failure rate. So if we did that, that would mean 26,000 people would die daily in this country from airline uh, travel and 9.5 million people per year. The reality of airline travel because of performance improvement is in 14 years, it's been 14 years since an air fatality and the actual rate is not, uh, not, uh, not 10,000 over a million, which would be a 99% success rate, it is four to the negative ninth. So it's it's four with, we move the decimal place nine, it's this many defects per million. It's minuscule. It's the fact that we have, you know, um, 2.5 million people travel a day on airline industry and it's been 14 years since there's been a fatality. So where are we at in healthcare? If you look at healthcare, and this is our, this is where we really do need PI. Um, Healthcare, when you look at the preventable deaths data that's out there for the number of patients who are inpatients, we are sitting at 8,366 defects per million. In other words, 9,000 patients die for every 1 million inpatients that, that we have, 9,000 per million. We are almost at this 99% success rate. We're, we're almost that bad. Um, and we actually have, we have um, a lot of people in healthcare here who, uh, who, who die preventable deaths. So we're doing a pretty bad job in healthcare. So, it, you know, we need to have performance improvement to help us get better. So what are some of the methodologies? Well, when you're talking in your respiratory department, there are some things that we would call just do it. You know, it's like the Nike method, just do it. Something is glaring that can be fixed with an easy fix. The problem is there are too many people who just do too many problems that they try to just do it when we need another methodology, we need to actually go through a process and we need to like help and fix something, I guess you'd say. So the just do it method is, you know, something glaring, fix it. It's an easy fix, it's a short standing fix. And the test, if this was right, is does the problem go away? If the problem doesn't go away with just do it, then um, you need something more significant. So we're gonna talk really quickly about PDCA, some people call it PDSA, Plan, Do, Check, Act. 
or we're going to talk a little bit about what Lean Six Sigma is, which is a methodology as well. Um, the one thing I'll say as a side note, um, having performance improvement as part of your department is part of the requirements of AARC APEX. So um, we're an APEX facility. Um, there's a handful out there across the country in the grand scheme of things. I would encourage you, if you are a solid uh, department, learn what the AARC APEX is and look at it. But know that you will have to have performance improvement in your department um, to be an ARC APEX facility. So what's PDCA, Plan, Do, Check, Act, like I made reference to? It's a longer process than just do it. It's um, larger. A lot of times you need a team. May need an interdisciplinary team, may just need a respiratory team in this case. It's for more complex problems than the just do it would fix. And it's a cycle. So think of it this way. You, you plan something that you think is a problem. You plan how you think you might fix it. And then you do a small, it might be a small scale thing. You do something to try and fix it. You check it. Guess what? You're going to need data. You're going to need observations. Check. And then you see if you got the gains you wanted. Maybe you got some of the gains, but not all the gains. And then you act to maybe modify that a little bit. But then it really becomes like this. It's a cycle. Then you say, okay, let's plan to make a different or a better improvement. Do it. Check it and act upon it, and then you continuously are cycling through things that need fixed. Lean Six Sigma is going to work very, very similarly, okay, except it's much, much more in-depth, but it's all things considered, it's very similar to uh, Plan, Do, Check, Act, or PDCA. So Lean Six Sigma, lean is one term that means eliminate waste, because lean, you know, so eliminating waste, what that really means is do only the right things. So this actually would be one of these types of things I'll sidestep a comment on, I believe, maybe even for, for Drager, and, and I've seen him around the country. Again, Gary Kaufman um, and Chatburn have been have published and have been talking about these, the respiratory, uh, you know, value-based care. And that really is doing only the right things. It's defining what the right things are and do only the right things. Don't do the things that are not the right things to do. That would be a lean approach. Six Sigma is to eliminate defects. Remember, there's a number of defects per million that I mentioned. So it's do it right the first time. And so when you combine Lean Six Sigma, you're basically saying, I want to do only the right things, and I want to do them right the first time. That's the most optimal way you can do anything, is do only the right things and do them right the first time. Um, it's very intense training. And again, I'm going to show you some things here I don't intend for you to necessarily learn, but I expect you to sort of get a feel for the process. Um, again, I mentioned this, Lean Six Sigma is the key to how the reason our automobiles are so good, and it's the key to why we can get on the airline and know that there's not a 1% chance we're gonna die. There is a zero point, many, many, many zeros of the four over one million chance we're gonna die if we get on an airline. In fact, it's better than you know driving on the roads. So what is the, the Lean Six Sigma method? I do this on purpose, not to show you all this, but to point out some things. You'll hear the DMAIC process, D-M-A-I-C process. This is what's called Lean Six Sigma. And the reason it's the DMAIC process is because instead of PDCA, it is define, measure, analyze, improve, control. But you can see it's a cycle here. This is like you're defining a problem. You measure how bad the problem is, analyze it, pick an improvement, and then try to control to make sure you maintain the game, but it's always cyclic. So whether it's PDCA or whether it is DMAIC, it is always a cycle. This just is showing you how in depth. These are tools and things you can use for Lean Six Sigma that you use in a Lean Six Sigma process. But the point is it's a it's a cycle. And I think I have a, I, I have something coming up in a second to show you to compare and contrast those two cycles. What I want to show you is just a very, very few number of tools. I think probably the most valuable tools that I've seen when, when I'm working on things in our department or um, for multidisciplinary groups. And the first of which is a, uh, is a SMART goal. So whenever you want to improve something, you should have a SMART goal. And that doesn't mean it's a smart person doing the goal. What it means is that it's, these is an acronym, it's specific, it's measurable, achievable, relevant, and timed. 
So what does a SMART goal mean? Well, let's read a goal. So I have a goal here that I popped up, improve ventilator care in the ICUs for all mechanically ventilated patients. That sounds really good, right? We always wanna improve the care in the ICU for all mechanically ventilated patients. If that is our goal, we'll never achieve anything. The reason is because it is not a SMART goal and it's not well-defined. Give you an example of how you might define this better and make it into a SMART goal. This would be a better goal, reduce the average length of stay on the ventilator for all ventilator patients in, take your name, pick XICU, whatever you could say, your MICU, your SICU, your whatever, from 4.5 days to 3.6 days by December, 2023. This here would be an example where this SMART goal is specific. It's, it's for an ICU, it's for vent patients, it's measurable. I have a measure here from 4.5 to 3.6 days. Is it achievable? Well, the team here has to say if this is achievable. Um, is it relevant? Yes, it's always relevant to reduce length of stay on the ventilator. And is it timed? Yes, we have a timing here when it's done. This is a SMART goal. The purpose is to clearly identify the main goal of the project and furthermore, the, 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 uh, the, the purpose is to stop scope creep. And what I mean by that is this is your scope also. So when people come in and say, yeah, let's do uh, medical and surgical ICU. Well, now you've just maybe doubled your population. You've crept your, you've, you've made your scope creep. You might say, okay, well, it's average length of stay and it's mortality. Okay, so now you've just scoped it differently as well. This really defines your scope and your purpose very clearly, and you should have this for any time you try to implement something to change something. This here just identifies and shows you how the PDCA and the DMAIC, the Lean Six Sigma, how there are some basic tools that are common to both. So we have the plan, which is also the define, measure, analyze, the do, which is the improve, the check, which is control, and the act, which is control. So these things line up, and we've got some specific um, some specific tools that line up to those. So again, I'm gonna give you a feel for a few of these and just tell you what the importance of some of these tools are. Again, if, you, if this is new to you, I don't expect you to remember these tools, just to know that there are processes to identify um, things that you're uh, trying to identify to make things better. So process mapping is one of these things that's very important. And I'll give you a sample. This was a process map about what it takes to get a patient extubated in a certain ICU. And if you look at the steps, these are the steps here in, in this row. And so this is like, it's like, what, 12 or 15 steps to get a patient extubated in ICU. What you want to do is look at each step and you want to identify, do we really need that step? What's the shortest amount of steps in the process to get this thing accomplished? because that's always gonna do, that's always gonna improve, improve, for example, length of stay. If you can get through the steps quicker, you're gonna get the patient off the vent quicker in this case. Um, you say, well, I can eliminate this, I eliminate this, eliminate this, and we go from here to here to here to here, and we're done, right? So the purpose of uh, process mapping is to identify wasteful steps. It's also to identify standardization because when a group gets together and says, here's how we do it, and they go, whoa, whoa, no, sometimes it goes this way, Sometimes this happens. You would have two branches. Sometimes people go, no, no, but it's a third branch. So now you've got three branches with all kinds of maybe irrelevant steps. You realize, hey, we need to standardize this thing and we need to reduce the number of steps. So that's, that's the purpose of process mapping is identify wasteful steps and also identify is there standardization or is there a deviation from things. Always important for frontline leaders to be a part of that. Uh, fishbone is another tool you can use. Here's a couple examples of fishbones that we've used. Here's a sort of a, just an online thing. But usually you, you take and you say, we've got an issue. So poor quality care. In this case, it was a, a ventilator associated uh, event occurs. And what you actually do is you say to yourself on the, the fishbone, what you do is you say, is there um, a people problem with this? Is there a patient problem with this? Is there provisions or resources, supplies? Is there a process or procedures that are a problem? Is it the place or the environment that's a problem? So with each of these things, you write down as many things as you can think that feed into the cause of this. So you can identify what the purpose of this is to identify root causes of a problem. So the fishbone is basically, it's a cause effect diagram. Here's the cause, the effect is the thing you're trying to fix. 
Next one's going to sound. Um, I just have a couple more tools, but the next one's going to sound complex, but it is really, um, it's a really good and really fairly straightforward tool. It's called an impact control matrix. And really what it's right in the name, it's trying to identify the things that you either as a group, when you think of a problem, have impact on or don't have impact. Like in other words, is there impact with certain, um, certain solutions and do you have control over it? So in other words, will a certain solution have impact and then will, can we control this? So when you see this graphic here, you're not too interested in the things that you either can't control, low, low control, or low impact, or sorry, low control here, low impact over here. You're not really too interested in things that you either can't control or you can't, that don't, don't impact the process. You are most interested in the solutions if you have high control and high impact to the process or the problem. So this helps you identify most appropriate solutions by saying, do we actually have control over these things? And does it really have impact on our process? I think one of the last, I think a second to last, I think I've got two more slides. Pareto chart is one that can really help you with most appropriate solutions as well. And what, what happens here is when you identify things that are causes, for example, this is readmission reasons for COPD patients. And in this case, respiratory reasons was, were the highest, but then there were cardiac and GI, ortho, other, renal, and sepsis. These are lined up in this sequence on purpose from highest to lowest. And this line here, this red line, is the cumulative of these bars. And a Pareto chart special because you see these individually, and then you see the cumulative. And a Pareto chart always is, the, the, the guidance always is, what... What are the combinations of the biggest things that cause 80% of the issue? They're the 80% of the cause. It's like that 80-20 rule. So if I line up over here and say, okay, here's 80%, that gets me to this third bar. So it means I'm going to focus, in this case, on respiratory, cardiac, and GI as issues. I'm not really worried about these other things because not much bang for our buck. So a Pareto chart helps us focus on most, most appropriate solutions. For a problem. And the last one is really when you're trying to see if you've impacted something. So you've you've got a this is just a generic sounding chart here, but let's say this could be mechanical ventilation here, length of stay, for example. I might have a few different phases. This might be my baseline and it's higher than I want it to be. And then in July we did some things, and in August we did some more things for length of stay on the ventilator, if that was what this was. And over time, I see this is my baseline, which means it's the way it was, and it's not the way we want it to be, and we make an impact. The control chart shows you, is there really a change? And what are these red bars? These are statistically done by the software to say this is an upper control limit, a lower control limit, meaning where does your data lie? Does it lie within one or two standard deviations of sort of a center point? This is usually the sort of the mean value. And you can see here our mean reduced. So whatever we did in July helped. Whatever we did in August helped further. So the purpose of a control chart is to track progress over time. Sometimes people use more basic charts than this. They don't have control limits. They just follow the process. And they can see if over time did things get better, did they get worse. Sometimes we impact things in a way we didn't expect. So those were uh, PI tools. Um, what I want to do is also talk about the fact that we are talking about changing things. So when you want to improve things, you want to change things, you are ultimately dealing with people. And that means you need to know change management concepts. You need to have a feel for it. So I want to give you a real br brief primer, a few slides on change management concepts. So change management this is causing, causing change is difficult and time consuming. So start right out there. It's difficult and it's time consuming. And guess what? I said in respiratory departments, we're starved for time. We're busy, right? So doing this right is tough in respiratory departments, but it's important or things don't, will not change as you'll see in just a couple of slides. So um, change is difficult. It's time consuming work. 
Uh, I like to always point this out. Change is generally undesirable by people. And I, I have an exercise. Hopefully you will all, I won't be able to see you, um, but I have an exercise that'll take just a couple of seconds to hopefully convey how undesirable change can be in, in just a couple of slides here. Um, but it is generally undesirable, especially if people don't know why. Sometimes when you when you describe the why, why are we doing this? In fact, I would recommend that always to people. Why are we doing this? That makes change a little less undesirable, but it's always going to be undesirable generally because we don't like to change things. Um, no change means no difference in outcomes, right? So you can't say, I want you guys to have more patients live on the ventilators in this unit, or I want you guys as a group to find out a way to, you need to get patients off the ventilator quicker, right? If you don't make any changes, guess what? There'll be no changes in outcomes. We are, because of uh, healthcare is a crunch, we are generally poor at creating positive change. Um, there are several different major change models. I've picked one that I particularly like, but know that there are multiple change models out there. Um, again, interest of time, I'm just gonna uh, mention one, but a couple of thoughts first, right? So um, you see this cartoon here, implementing these changes won't be easy. We're pretty set in doing things the wrong way, right? I think that's all of us, right? When If we aren't doing things the newest, best, the right way, then we're, we're pretty set in doing them not the best way. So I always say when, when changing a system, keep it as simple as possible. Remember back to the flow chart I showed you. You will never, if, if you have tons and tons of process for a change, you're ne it's going to be really difficult to implement a change that is really complex. Keep it as simple as possible. Less is more. And one more thing that I really want to make it sink in is each system is perfectly designed to achieve the results that you're getting. And to improve the system, you must change the system. So say that another way, I mentioned uh, ventilate to stay, right? Right now, you may like a uh, vent length of stay, or we could call, talk readmission rate, we could talk mortality rate, we could talk whatever. If you have a, you or at your hospital or people at your institution have a value that they are not happy with, the readmissions or the post-op um, post infections or complications are high or whatever, what I will say is, your system right now is perfectly designed to achieve those results, perfectly designed, because that's the results it's achieving. And the only way you will change the results is change the system somehow. So like I have on here, let that sink in a little bit. You will never change anything. That we, we say this in other ways in, in the world, right? People say doing the same thing over and over again, but expecting a different outcome is what? It's 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 futile. It's like you're 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 a nutcase if you think that you're going to get something different when you do something over and over in this world. So um, that's really it's maybe one of the more important things about change um, it, right there on that slide. So here, I'm not going to turn my uh, camera. Maybe I will turn my camera on just for those who can see. Let's see what happens here. Um, so I have two exercises that I'm gonna ask you to do. I don't know if you can see me or not, but what I'm gonna do is if you get into the like praying, like where you feather your, your fingers together like you're praying, right? Feather your fingers together. You all picked an index finger on top that is your prefer, it, that's the way you do it. Pull your hands apart, put the other index finger on top. So feather your fingers together, put the other finger, it's awful. I see it on Winnie's face, she's playing right into me, and into what I'm saying here, but it's, we don't like change. There is nothing wrong with putting your hands together this way. It's the same thing as it was. But it's one easy example to say, like, change is difficult. And when you think about this, think about what would it take to make you do it this way instead of the other way? Like, what things would have to happen to make this your natural way? Another thing you can do is fold your arms. Fold your arms like you're, you know, this is bad. John's doing a bad job. You're, you're upset. The arm that's on top when you fold your arms, now fold your arms the other way. A lot of people have to figure it out, but fold your arms the other way. So in front of you, it's tough. It's not worse, but it feels awful. What would it take to get you to fold your arms differently? The, the point being, people do not like change. And uh, I'm gonna turn my, I'll spare you and turn my, uh, my camera back off. 
Um, we'll go back to this, but yeah, from, from that standpoint, just think about that. That's a simple illustration that it changes difficult. One of the things I like to point out is, and again, this is one of the change management concepts that, um, that I really like. And this is Greg Shea. He has a couple books and some articles on this. He calls it levers of change. So think of these as levers or light switches in a sense. These are, there's uh, eight light switches here and you have to switch something or do something different with each of these levers of change. So what this is, is the organization, you have to change organizational charts or um, how people report to each other or who has authority. You have to change maybe decision allocating, like allow people to make decisions, frontline leaders. You have to change how you distribute information to people about this change. So who has access to the information? Are you measuring it? Are you putting on a dashboard or have metrics that you're showing to people? Are you rewarding people with the change? As you see things happen, do you celebrate? Do you reward people? Have you taken people and done skills and training, not just tell them what to do? The worst thing you could do is say at a department meeting, the director or a manager says, you know what? Our patients are on the vent too long. You guys need to do X, Y, and Z differently from now on to do it. What I will say is 15% of people will do it for a short time. The rest will not do it. And within a week or two, what you just said is extinguished. So you need to take people, you need skills or training. You need to hardwire it into the task, hardwire it into a process. You may need to have workplace design, whether that's in a computer or a physical workplace design. So think of these things as different levers. And what Greg Shea says is you need four, at least you need to hit four of these different realms to make successful change and maybe even more than that, but at least four. If you don't hit four of these realms, you will not make a successful change. So data dashboards and metrics, we're gonna jump into for a second. And that really goes into this, you know, showing people how do we distribute information to people and how do we measure it or show it on dashboard. So got a few quotes here that I think are interesting, right? So what gets measured gets managed. If you aren't measuring length of stay on the ventilator and, and putting it out in front of people's faces, you aren't managing it. You're not optimizing it. Facts do not cease to exist because they're ignored. I would actually say data does not cease to exist just because they're ignored. Ignoring the data doesn't mean that the problem will go away. And uh, I like this one in particular. If we have data, let's look at data. If all we have are the opinions, then let's go with mine. So, there's a couple more things I've got about this before we hit sort of two um, examples to just wrap this together, but process measures versus outcomes measures. So this goes along with data and the data theme. Process measures are measurements of things that are part of the process if you're implementing something new. For example, um, if we're looking at length to stay on the ventilator, number of SBTs that should have been performed would be a process measure. Did you perform the SBTs? And then the outcomes measure in that case would be what's your length to stay on the ventilator or your length to stay in the hospital? Did those things change? So process measures are, did things happen that were supposed to happen? And outcomes are, did we actually change the process? Or the, did, we change, did we change the outcomes by changing the process? I'll give you an example of that. This is a um, really old dashboard of ours from um, when we did some implementations, but this is waning parameters or like doing that spontaneous breathing trial to see if people are ready to get on a formal SBT. This is people actually getting an SBT. This is our therapists attending multidisciplinary rounds after the SBT is done to be able to report off the success. And this is the length of stay on the ventilator in that unit. So you can see as we did weaning parameters, over time we implemented this, we implemented making sure we're doing all the SBTs we can do attending rounds to communicate with the physicians, you see our length of stay on the ventilator drop quite nicely. So in this case, this, this, and this are all process measures. These are processes that we changed. And you can see in that case, the outcome then changed for, this, uh, for, for these patients. So just an example of process measures versus outcome measures. So I've got a couple of things to walk through two examples to walk through, but I want to I want to sort of define like a couple of things that wrap this together. So what is the point of implementing anything? And I'll also say, what's the point of 
PI, what do you say, PI, QI, VI, whatever. What is the point of any of this stuff? We're busy. We're busy. Don't bother us, right? What's the point of this? So there has to be a point to doing this stuff. And the point of these are we either can improve care, outcomes, reduce patient harm. Hopefully we're looking at those things or increasing, hmm, something's going on funny there, increase revenue and or reduce costs. So this is, so improve care, change finances or improve caregiver or patient satisfaction, right? These are really all the big, so you should not be implementing anything or trying to do PIQI, value improvement, quality improvement, PI, unless it's impacting one of these things, right? You're either improving care, reducing harm, and getting better finances, or making a life better for caregivers or patients. There's really almost no other reason in a hospital to, to worry or think about like, what's the point of doing this? So what are the two examples we're gonna walk through? So I picked two different examples that are unique. Number one, this is an impl implementation that is not that, that not everyone needs to be trained on, or at least not first. So it's a small scale implementation in a department. These things happen at times. What would be examples of those? NICU device. So if I'm not all NIC, if not everyone's a NICU person, so it's smaller scale. NICU device or procedure, specialty adult procedure, maybe specialized bronchoscopy. In our case, we're gonna talk about measuring transpulmonary pressure monitoring. So sinking an esophageal balloon and doing uh, transpulmonary pressure monitoring. The second example is going to be to, you know, the the uh, the other side of things. It's an implementation that everyone in your department, depending on the department size, like we have about 150 people in my department, um, so it's a big undertaking. Everyone needs to be trained well. And what what would be examples of that? They need to be trained well. They need to be competent. They need to perform it well. So new ventilator, a new medication device. Uh, in this case, we're going to talk about protective ventilation. Um, on patients, because you need to be protecting everyone. This is wide scale stuff, right? So we're gonna talk about, I'm gonna walk through both of these things and sort of show you how implementation and PI kind of kind of flow into each other. So the first one is transpulmonary pressure monitoring, preparing for implementation. So when you sit down and you prepare for implementation, in our case, well, I'll give you some specifics, but when you prepare, right, you're gonna review the literature typically, right? You gotta figure out the why, like why do we wanna do this? Why take the effort? You're going to need to communicate, right? In the department, you got to tell people, hey, there's this upcoming change that's going to be happening. Medical director's got to be on board with it. Critical care coordinator has to be on, critical care director, nursing needs to be on board, potentially, depending on what it is. Providers, the physicians. Um, deciding if it's policy, guidelines, orders, you know, what is it? Is it is this a policy change? Are there guidelines on this? Um, is it just recommendations? Are there orders? Like, do, do you need to change your medical record with, from an order standpoint? Is it therapist driven? Is it provider order driven? You know, it, it depends on who the key stakeholders are. What type of in-servicing are you gonna be able to do for this? Is it web? Is it online? Is it in person? Are you gonna have quizzes? Are you gonna check competency of people? Are you gonna have education boards? You know, how are you gonna make sure this gets out to everybody? And uh, what's the timing of this? Is it during work? Is it short enough they can come in and do it during work? Do they have to do it outside of their shift before or after their shift? What time of year, depending on when you're busy um, or not busy or whatever? I mean, I think we're busy around, around the clock, but there are probably some windows of time that's, that may be good for your institution. So you have to consider all these things when you're preparing for implementation. So specific to transpulmonary pressure monitoring, throwing a balloon down and into a patient's uh, esophagus and monitoring them with it. What we find on, we found that we were gonna focus at first on ARDS and morbid obesity. So those are the two, two populations we were looking at. Again, when we talk about communication, we included all st key stakeholders. We talked about this with our department that said this, this stuff is coming. Um, we uh, couldn't initially create a policy on this. We realized, we were, I'd say we were smart enough to know there's gonna be some trial and error at first. We, we got a small group of therapists who did this at first. In setting this up, again, preparing, we had meetings and phone calls with external experts and people who, who were doing this out there um, at their institution. We referenced all the available literature. 
We looked at all the different options for how to do this. So we basically had this planning with a small group of people. We also um, offered um, some, some ARC approved education for the topic in general so people could be educated to what is this topic that we're doing. It's not the actual process of it for how we do it here, but it's the topic of understanding what do you do with transpulmonary pressure monitoring? How do you, you know, what, what, what are the implications of this monitoring? And we in-service small groups at first when we implement it. So let's think about this. We prepared for this implementation, right? But the reality is, this is a PDA cycle. And all that preparation we told you about, that I just told you about that we did, that's the plan of a PDCA cycle, right? We did all that preparation on our plan. And then guess what? The do phase is we actually started monitoring some patients, right? That's our do phase. Small group of, of therapists who um, got this education and one particular specialist who was overseeing it, trying to get people educated. We're doing it now. We're, we're, we're looking at it and figuring out how do we do this? The check, the check for us in, in included following data and dashboards. We started looking at the data on these patients. We started communicating the process or the progress. How, what did we find when we started monitoring patients? What were the barriers? Did we find barriers that we needed to fix? We found that the type of monitor we were using, we worked sometimes and sometimes it didn't. It was tough to acquire the equipment sometimes. Celebrate successes at the department. Um, add therapists who are performing us. That was all part of the check process. And the act was we took actions to remove any barriers we found. We pivoted in our act to focus solely on morbid obesity because what we found was we didn't feel like we were seeing, and some of the literature showed this, not much of a effect for the ARDS population, so we pivoted to morbid obesity. So you can see this whole thing here, we went through a plan, do, check, act process in a sense. It was all part of the implementation and managing it. So um, what, what, was, what happened, well, we, we uh, ended up doing a, a poster on this process, and then we eventually were able to do enough uh, patients where we actually uh, published a paper on it. So really good stuff here to, um, to let, let the world know what we were doing with uh, transpulmonary pressure monitoring. So again, back to this number two uh, implementation is everyone needs to be trained. And we're talking uh, protective ventilation. So specifically, we're talking tidal volume. Lung protective ventilation, what was our preparation? Again, all this stuff that I mentioned, figuring out all this stuff ahead of time. So what were the things that we came up with for the for preparing for implementation? We focused first on tidal volume, like I mentioned. We focused on eight mLs for everyone, focused on six mLs for the sickest patients, knowing that we also educated, you go down uh, four mLs if, they're, if their plateau pressures are high, but eight mLs for everyone, six mLs for the sickest, we included, again, all stakeholders. We did lots of communication to our department, to physicians, to nursing, um, at our critical care committee. In this case, we created a policy right off the bat. Um, we changed the electronic orders once. We changed them over time to be more stringent, to make sure that people were ordering the right order. It was based on provider order, but we know that it's very, very guided by therapists, but physicians actually put the order in, providers. We did, live, we did live education on that was an ARC approved education about why would you care to protect the lungs of patients, the fact that we can save lives. We did live in services as, um, for the policy, as well as we posted education boards. We did lots of communication. Um, and we did it um, at the end of the summer into early fall because we knew that was probably an opportune time to do this. We did the education. It ended up being long enough, it was outside of work, it was before or after, and the in-servicing was actually during work time. So again, back to lung protective ventilation, you know, what did we do? The, pre the prep that I talked about was all part of that plan. The do was actually doing it, making sure that we were setting safe settings for patients. Again, check was following data and dashboards, pretty much what we did before, communicating progress, identifying barriers, celebrating successes. And the act was to continue to remove barriers and to change things further, to now maybe educate to plateaus and then start looking at this, drive pressures and start looking at this stuff. So incorporating more protective things. 
why did we have to do this as a, uh, why, why do I say that if we do this and just make a policy and tell people to do it, that it's, it's just done like a lot of places do? Well, here's the thing we know. I mean, this is a 2010 journal of patients, arts patients at institutions that were ArtsNet centers. So these are places that help publish ArtsNet that if you turn the tidal volume down, patients do better. In this case, in this follow-up, 41% of the patients were not compliant with ArtsNet in ArtsNet centers after the ArtsNet study was over. 37% of patients were never treated with low tidal volume ventilation. So the point being, if you take your eye off of it and you don't go through the hard work to do the, these things, you, 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 don't, you don't keep the gains. What did we do? I took some specifics off this chart, but here's how we follow data. <clears throat> Excuse me. So this blue line is the percent of patients that were at Christiana that were um, compliant with, with our, our target uh, lung protection settings. We did education, we did monitoring, we did feedback, we had data dashboards, we did more education. And you can see the percent of patients improved that were compliant with lung protective ventilation. This is back in 2015. We've gotten even much better now. Yeah, I took, so no one can freak out, I took off the percentages here, but over time our hospital survival for vent patients increased um, when we did this. So patients, more patients lived when we put them on lung protective settings. I mentioned change management when I talked about doing PI tools and change management stuff. So let's think about what did we do here for lung protective ventilation? We did, I talked about the PI process for that, but we actually did workplace design. We, we redesigned things in the orders to change things. We changed and we added processes and policies. So we hit this. We did specific people training and skills chain, training. We did rewards and we, we celebrated when the, when the data was good. We measured it, we put it on dashboards. So minimally we did this. We probably bled over into some of these things, but for sure we did these things. Um, as we, uh, so we flipped five of these levers and we've actually had some really good sustained change. So summary and take home points, and I believe we'd have a couple minutes for questions. Implementing any of this stuff requires resources, time and data. It's tough in the present environment. We talked about respiratory care departments and just the pressures on respiratory care. Implementation should incorporate PI. So in other words, how I bled from implementing, just implementing something new. I mean, you really need to think about it as a PI process. You know, and also you need to be asking yourself, why do we do any of this stuff? We need to be improving outcomes, finances, satisfaction of patients, all those things we talked about. And, and also keep in mind to become an apex, apex facility, this is really important, and I think rightly so, because this is a, a place that's gonna make things better. Um, there are a variety of methods. We talked about PDCA, we talked about Lean Six Sigma. Um, team collaboration is important. I made reference to it. It's not authoritarian leadership that stands up in front of the department and says, you need to change this. Yelling at people or having an authoritarian view of this will never lead to change. You'll extinguish change quicker than you'll make it. Um, many people don't desire change, remember that. Just people don't like it, it's uncomfortable. Just like the, the, the fingers and the arm exercise we did, it's uncomfortable. Um, change management, I showed you about that. Remember that four levers, you've gotta hit multiple layers of things that cause change to occur and sustain. And also to sustain it, you have to be tracking it, you have to be watching it on data and dashboards to make sure that you can continue to um, see that you've gained the changes that you wanted, that you're gaining the outcomes that you want. You can ongoing celebrate those outcomes as well. 